Hello there, my name's Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. In 2009, the Marine and Coastal Access Act paved the way for the replacement of England's long-serving sea fishery committees with new Inshore Fishery Conservation Authorities, or IFCAs, which came into being in 2011. But if the truth be known, most sea anglers won't have much of a clue about the workings or relevance to them of either organisation. Save for the odd catch inspection by a fisheries enforcement officer, which for me in over 40 years of small boat fishing has only ever happened once, the old sea fisheries committees have little if any visible impact or value to sea anglers, many of whom think much the same way about the new IFCAs. That said, with what's in the pipeline in terms of legislation over the next few years, both sea anglers and the governing bodies could well be in the something of a big surprise. To what extent and why depends on where in England you live, as the country has been divided up into ten separate, though linked, authority areas, each with its own local issues to deal with, in addition to stuff that's happening on a national and even Europe-wide scale. Since late 2011 to present, which is early 2013, I've been representing recreational sea angling on the North West IFCA as a Marine Management Organisation, or MMO, point E. As such, I'm familiar with both the workload as well as incoming issues. I think it would be fair to say that much of what we here in the North West have been dealing with so far has had little or nothing to do with recreational sea angling. But from what I know is imminent, I can confidently say that this most certainly will not continue to be the case. Just exactly what is coming our way is something we'll look at in a little more detail later. First, let's take an historical look at the old sea fisheries committees, chronologically working our way through to 2011 and the IFCA concept becoming reality, with North West IFCA Chief Executive Officer Dr Stephen Atkins, in whose office in the middle of Carnforth I'm currently sat. I'm Dr Stephen Atkins and I'm Chief Executive of the North West Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authority and I'm pleased to answer these questions but I just want to emphasise that they are my comments, my personal views and don't in any way represent official views of the uh, Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authority or, or any of its members. Let me throw a quote at you. To lead, champion and manage a sustainable marine environment and inshore fisheries by successfully securing the right balance between social, environmental and economic benefits to ensure healthy seas, sustainable fisheries and a viable industry. According to your website, that is IFCA's published objective. As Chief Executive of IFCA North West and of its predecessor body, explain to us briefly the role of the now defunct sea fisheries committees, why they needed to be reformed and how the structure, and indeed overall remit, differs from other IFCAs all around the country. That's a very big question. Sea Fishery Committees were in existence for over 100 years, started in 1890 and moved on to 2011 when they were were, uh, changed over to IFCAs. And of course a lot changed in 100 years. Fishing became very different, a lot of modernisation took place, a lot of legislation changed, And it just became evident that fisheries legislation and fisheries regulation was not fit for purpose. Sea fishery committees didn't have anywhere near adequate powers to properly regulate a lot of the intertidal fisheries that take place in northwest England. They weren't able, for example, to restrict the numbers of permits that they could issue adequately. All the costs of regulation fell on local council taxpayers, local taxpayers as opposed to the fishing industry. There was just a whole load of limited powers and um, incapacity, old-fashioned systems and procedures which had to be brought up to date. There had been a lot of talk of this. Government had conducted a lot of reviews into sea fishery committees and into the regulation of the fishing industry. And they brought this all together as best they could in the Marine Act 2009, which set up the IFCAs with hopefully modernised powers and a much greater capacity to regulate the industry as it is today. And were there any differences in how the old sea fishery committees operated on a regional basis? Compared with IFCA? No, compared with each other. Well, yes, they'd all developed individually. They were very much local bodies which developed their own local solutions to every issue that arose. And just as the fisheries varied around the country, the regulations varied. So every sea fishery committee made its own set of bylaws. 
Some of them matched, but most of them didn't. We've had to merge with Cumbria Sea Fishery Committee. The North West Sea Fishery Committee merged with the Cumbria Sea Fishery Committee to become the North West Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authority. And we've got completely different sets of bylaws, which we're now having to merge. And it's one of our objectives to try and merge the two sets of bylaws as soon as we can. I take it that the old committees would have had more of a commercial fishing feel to them and wouldn't have had the same statutory bodies or specific appointees that the IFCAS have today. Uh, No, there were DEFRA appointees. The Sea Fishery Committees were much the same in the sense that they were made up of council members who comprised actually half, whereas now they comprise a third, and DEFRA appointees as they were then. They were appointed by the Secretary of State. Now they're appointed by the MMO. But... Much the same selection of people, they were selected to represent different sectors of the fishing industry, scientific expertise and other stakeholders in the district. What then sets the IFCAs and the All Committees apart in terms of what they can and must do? They have uh, greater bylaw making powers, they can make bylaws for a much wider range of activities. They have conservation responsibilities uh, to a much greater extent than the Sea Fishery Committees did. Now we're called Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authorities, so conservation is right up there in the title. And we're seen as the lead authority now in the marine environment out to six miles for regulation of the whole marine environment, not just fisheries. So that's probably the biggest change. That now, for example, we're going to have responsibilities for managing these marine conservation zones, for making conservation regulations for the new European marine sites and other conservation areas. I think that's probably the biggest difference. And just for completeness, can you give us an idea of the range of stakeholder interests these appointees now represent? The MMO appointees, we've got five or six members from different commercial fishing sectors. We've got two or three members from angling interests. We've got several scientists, uh, both from the Environment Agency background and from university sector. We've got marine industries and we've also got conservation. So we've got, for example, RSPB on this committee, but um, other committees have different conservation representatives. And we also have uh, members from three statutory agencies, the Marine Management Organisation, Natural England and the Environment Agency. They each have a reserved place on all the IFCAs. A bit of a pointy question I suppose, but do you think they've got the balance about right in terms of getting the best result? (laughs) That's difficult to say. MMO have taken on the responsibility of appointing the members. They do it by competitive application. They go through a formal process that's meant to be compliant with Nolan rules and they're doing the best they can. We might find that Sometimes we don't get totally balanced representation, but we're limited by the people who apply in the district and by the recruitment process. Difficult to see how you can make it much better. As a current member myself, I'll take that as a positive. But has this IFCA perhaps inherited difficulties that many of the other IFCAs don't have with regard to merging and replacing two previously independent organisations in Lancashire and Cumbria, rather than just having to rebrand the old one? It seems to me that there's something of an imbalance in the distribution of resources, with a definite bias towards Cumbria with regard to protection vessels. So are the plans to centralise that resource, or instead have maybe other smaller craft berthed at, say, Fleetwood and or Liverpool, to ensure equal measures of protection and justice? Well, we are trying to work out what kit we need where. It is true that we inherited a patrol boat based in Whitehaven in the north of the district, and uh, the old North Western patrol boat was sold to Wales at the transfer and death from the Welsh Assembly required that to happen. They took it out of our hands. Uh, so we have ended up with a patrol boat in the north. On the other hand, it does work because most of the offshore work that's required is in the north. There isn't a lot of offshore fishing in the south of the district. There's very big prawn fisheries and landings of scallops that come through the ports in the north and probably there is the greatest need for the patrol vessel up there. What we do want to establish is some inshore patrol vessels in the rest of the district. I would like to get a a good big rib of some sort, a rigid inflatable boat established in Barrow to deal with Morecambe Bay and Walney Island and those areas, 
and I'd also like to establish one down in the south of the district to cover the Mersey and the Dee and the coastline around those areas. And I think they would best be done by ribs, and we are in the process of getting them set up and coded for both areas. Seeing curbs on commercial fishing, particularly that carried out by smaller inshore boats, plus the thorny subject of discards, are all things which justifiably or otherwise concern sea anglers very much. But before shouting too loudly, we need to be sure our own house is in order. So what can you tell us about the angling side of IFCA's enforcement work? We have quite a number of shore-based patrol officers in our district because we have a lot of shore-based fishing. Not just angling, of course. We have all the intertidal shell fisheries. We have a lot of intertidal netting. Uh, we have very big intertidal areas like Morecambe Bay and the Ribble and the Solway Firth. So there's very extensive areas of shoreline. And so it has been necessary for us to make sure we have plenty of shore-based fishery officers. And as part of their patrols, they every day check any anglers that they come across on their patrols. They talk to them about what they're catching and how the catches are going. They make sure they're complying mostly with the minimum size limits. That's the main area of compliance that has to be enforced with respect to anglers. And I think a lot of anglers in our district would have seen fishery officers around. They often know them, they, they speak to them. And the details of the people that have been met, the details of the anglers have been spoken to, any catch that's been checked is recorded on the daily logs of all the fishery officers. So as you go back through the daily logs, you can see where they've been and spoken to a couple of anglers and they've checked so many fish and any um, undersized ones that are noted and, and put back, they're recorded as well. So there is a level of enforcement. Obviously, we only have three or four, four fish officers on the shore across our district. That's the level of capacity that we have. And so they don't get to any one area, perhaps more than once every few weeks. So on the ground, it may not look very often, but there is a level of patrolling and enforcement going on all the time. Well, I've had boats continuously since the 1970s, always fishing the file course where at various times I've been a member of all three launching clubs, which between them do rather concentrate activity at specific spots, thereby making it very easy to intercept and check catches. In addition to that, for the past several years, on the smaller tides I've been fishing from the only launchable spot on the Mersey, which is New Brighton. Yet in all that time, I've only ever seen a protection officer once. Hmm. Well, I suppose to be fair, under sea fishery committees, angling tended not to be a sector that received a lot of attention. In the past, with very big commercial offshore fisheries, angling was very much a small activity compared with commercial fishing. Now that commercial fishing has declined to the extent that it has, angling has probably increased overall and become a lot more efficient and effective. Anglers are better at catching fish than they used to be and now they're catching a much greater proportion of the total catch that's being landed. And so I think we're all aware that angling needs perhaps more enforcement attention. We need to pay more attention to how much is being caught and what is being caught so we know more about it. And uh, the Angling 2012 project that we were involved in last year hopefully has given us an initial survey that will improve our knowledge of how much angling is taking place and I think we'll try and follow that up with more recording of angling data throughout the district in the future. With regard to the south of the district, I must say, when we were in North Western and North Wales, we had a gap in our coverage between the officer in Fleetwood and the officer in Colwyn Bay. There wasn't anyone much in between. We didn't patrol the Mersey at all because um, Liverpool was never in our... Sea Fishery Committee, they never contributed anything, and so the Mersey, although technically it was in our district, we didn't patrol it. We didn't patrol the D because that was all covered by the Environment Agency. Now we do have some responsibility for the D, particularly for the mussels and, well, angling and other, other fisheries there. So we've installed a new officer in the Mersey D area, based in Liverpool. We want to have him equipped with a rib and we're gradually getting to know a lot more about what's going on down there. And I certainly don't think you'd go another few years without meeting a fishery officer down there. I think we should be having much greater coverage over the next few years than we have in the past. Do you not think, though, that with anglers being so vocal and claiming that nothing ever gets done, 
It might make for good PR to be seen to be out and about, planting the thought that if we are being checked, then so too are the commercials. Though I do accept that there will always be some who will see it as a time waster or even a harassment. Yeah, I think that is the approach that we want to adopt from now on. And it is a bit of a change of direction of IFCAS compared with sea fishery committees. Yes, uh, that, that is the way we want to go. And angling 2012 should have given us a bit of a kickstart on that process. A lot of anglers will have met uh, Alistair Lindop on his patrols, doing his particular visits, and I would hope to continue that. So, yeah, we do want to record a lot more of what anglers are doing. We want to get to know them better. I've given a talk to the Blackpool, I think it was the Blackpool Club, one evening a couple of years ago, three years ago maybe, and Alistair is also making contact with the angling clubs, and uh, we're keen to meet up with them, give them presentations about who the IFCA are and what they do, outline the bylaws and the regulations. We're very pleased to, to do that, so we would like to have angling contacts, we'd like to know who all, who all the clubs are if we haven't got them, and keep in touch. We're also producing a newsletter which will have information about the work going on with respect to angling as well. We'll have an angling section in the newsletter. And from your officer's notebooks, does it appear that anglers are happy, or at least not hostile to being checked, and that generally they are abiding by the rules? I think mostly anglers are quite compliant and quite good at keeping the rules. I don't think we have a lot of issues. There's conflict with netters. There's an ongoing issue of conflict between anglers and netsmen that the fishery officers experience. Sometimes it's justified, sometimes it's not, and sometimes it's one side or the other that's in the wrong. But fishery officers sort that out as best they can on the ground and deal with it. In general, I think they comply with the minimum size. We've had a particular problem at the Hesham Power Station that we're dealing with through a bylaw, and if we came across any other areas like that which needed particular attention and particular regulation, then we'd be keen to put in regulations that are necessary. We're getting quite good support from anglers. I've had five or six emails in this morning saying that they're supportive of the Hesham Bass bylaw, and only one guy says he isn't. And uh, I've got somebody downstairs who's been looking at the angling websites and blogs or whatever information circulation they use. And generally, they're finding the same. Probably about 80% of people are supportive of the new bylaw. So we'll see how that works, because there has been a particular problem there with taking undersized and with destroying a lot of undersized fish through not putting them back properly. Obviously, depending on where you are in the country, different concerns regarding the impact of angling are going to be given greater or lesser weighting. But I think that we're all agreed that from a national perspective, both anglers and fishery regulators recognise that something needs to be done on the subject of bass. Allowing the cropping of any species before it's had the opportunity to replace itself, never mind one that's vulnerable and slow growing, makes no scientific sense to anglers and commercials alike. The fundamental question then has to be, do those who make and implement the rules governing the species really believe that the level of protection currently in place can ensure a sustainable bass population? Um, who are you thinking of, those who make and implement the rules? Well, the national legal minimum takeable size for bass is currently 36 centimetres, yet fishery scientists have demonstrated that few, if any, bass breed below 42 centimetres. So how can you set a legal cropping limit at a size where fish have not been given the opportunity to replace themselves? How do people expect to sustain a population when the law says it can be cropped before it reproduces? Well, ultimately, yes, I, I, I fully agree with you. And as, as I understand it, DEFRA also agree with you. From a general policy point of view, we would like to go towards increasing the minimum landing size some of us in some areas are not convinced that we need to as yet. If there's any suggestion that the population isn't sustainable, then we need to know that it isn't. And if we get data that says it isn't sustainable, either locally or nationally, then there would be a big incentive to do something about it. It seems to me at the moment most people are saying that the population of bass is pretty stable or even increasing in many areas and uh, it may be getting a bit of a boost from global warming, sea level warming, that sort of thing, which seems to be, if anything, increasing the number of bass. So I don't think there's a problem at the moment that bass isn't sustainable. Clearly, if it became clear that it wasn't sustainable, then one of the first things you would want to look at is increasing the minimum landing size above the size at first breeding, because uh, that obviously would uh, 
give you a chance of getting a better a reproductive life history balance, um, size frequency type of balance across the population. Is it not the case that locally data could be skewed as Hesham's warm water outfalls attract a great many immature bass, not all of which will be caught, and therefore due to special circumstances, bass population numbers in say Morecambe Bay can appear to be high when taken in isolation, while the bigger picture could look a whole lot different. I don't know. From a fishery management point of view, I look at it, is there a stable or declining or increasing stock of fish? That's the question. I appreciate, from an ecological point of view, cropping them before they get to a certain size is a bad thing if the population is at risk. If, on the other hand, they are reproducing in sufficient numbers to keep the population up, despite the level of cropping at whatever size we're taking at the moment, then there isn't really a need to do anything. That would be my view at the moment. The general consensus is that with bass being such a slow growing and frequently poor species in terms of spawning success, what we see today could well be the result of low cropping who knows when, and that overcropping today, while it might appear to be having little effect now, could in fact be storing up problems for the future. And with that in mind, increased minimum landing sizes, slot limits and close seasons are the only way of preventing this. I wouldn't disagree with that. Those are the sort of measures we would bring in if we had to increase it. What I would say is that it's very difficult to to do this sort of thing on a national species at the local level. You will be seen as putting your local fishermen at a disadvantage compared with others and of displacing fishing from one area to another. So if we increase the minimum landing size in the northwest, our fishermen proportion of fishermen will go and fish somewhere else where they can still fish 36 whether it's in Wales or Scotland or on the east coast. Uh, so you don't necessarily achieve very much by bringing in measures at local level and at the IFCA level I've talked with the other chief officers um, that the bass issue has been on the agenda for quite a while and we're aware that bass as an association would like to increase the minimum landing size and we have taken the view that we push the pressure on to DEFRA and say this needs to be done at the national or even the EU level if it's going to be properly effective. Personally, I think that aiming at EU level is pretty much the same as not doing anything at all. With national level, I'm a little bit more optimistic, if only in the thought that it could happen, though still it probably won't. So why not flex a bit of muscle locally by the use of bylaws, which we are entitled to do, providing we're building on rather than undermining the legislation. Who knows, maybe it would even trigger a nationwide domino effect. Well, I think there has to be a demonstrated need regionally. At the moment, the reports that are coming to me are that there's plenty of bass about. There's quite high levels of catching going on. Our Hesham bylaw could have quite an impact on the overall catch of bass in the district because as I understand it, a very high proportion of bass caught in the district are pulled out at Hesham and a lot are thrown back because they're, they're undersized with potentially a quite low survival rate. So that's why we brought in that, that bylaw. I think that's a good local measure. Local nursery areas, ways of protecting them locally other than the minimum landing size, I think probably would be preferable rather than, as I say, disadvantaging our areas compared with adjacent ones. What are your thoughts on slot limits then? Were besides fish under the minimum legal size being returned, others of a size over, say, 70 centimetres must also go back, as these are the prime breeding stock with a proven genetic ability to avoid dangers and predators, and would presumably, therefore, make the best contribution of all to population numbers and also to stock health? Mm, I don't know the evidence for bass very well myself, uh, but I'm certainly open to, uh, to considering that, and I know that's been talked about at the national level as well. It's quite difficult to police slot limits, particularly the small size of it, but um, I'm not against it. If it's concluded that that's what the fishing industry supports as a means of going forward in preference to a, a bigger increase in the minimum landing size, for example, then I would certainly be willing to go with that. Again, I, I think it's, it's a national measure, probably in preference to a local measure. I can see there may be justification for changing the minimum landing size locally if you've clearly got different stocks locally. But in general, I think I'd probably make them national. But I'm not against it, you know. 
This is probably a good point to bring in the actions of our nearest overseas neighbour and fellow EU member Ireland, who to combat their vast decline have brought in a range of protective measures including close seasons, bag limits and a review of the minimum landing size, which was already way bigger than ours at 45 centimetres and may even go up to 50 centimetres in the near future. As a result, they're now reaping the rewards in terms of both fish and angler visitor numbers, demonstrating very clearly that the commercial value of a bass is far lower than the angling value of the same fish. I don't know the situation in Ireland at all. I don't know how their stocks are going. I know that that's a regular way of managing salmon fisheries, for example, in rivers, is to limit what you can take home, your catch and release schemes and that sort of thing. And yet a close season too. A big jump up to 50 centimetres would have a big commercial impact if we were to impose it locally. I mean, I assume you're thinking that these measures would apply equally to all fishermen, commercial or amateur. Of course. We would have a very big commercial impact if we were to put up from 36 to 50, or even probably 36 to 45, frankly, would make a big commercial impact. We'd affect people's incomes, their livelihoods, and... For that reason, we get a lot of opposition to it. And again, that makes it difficult to do it locally. If nationally it can be agreed, if it can be agreed at EU level, then I would be happy to go with it. But it could, with the right will of support, be done locally as a bylaw. It could, in theory, be done. But I don't want to think of creating a little enclave where we have much tighter regulations than the areas round about. For, I mean, one, one impact will be that the areas round about won't be very pleased with us because we will displace all our anglers to them. Or a, a lot of anglers who are not so much interested in big fish but interested in fish to eat. Exploring that very topic with our previous enforcement director, I was told in no uncertain terms that he would rigorously oppose a bylaw change to up the minimum landing size of bass on the grounds of shortage of manpower to enforce it. As there is already a minimum landing size for the species which should be getting enforced anyway, upping it from 36 centimetres to 45 centimetres would add nothing to the current workload. It's just a different measurement on the same ruler. Yeah, I don't have any comment on that. I don't see why it should take more manpower, except you would have a lot less sized fish caught, so there would be a much greater incentive for people who weren't just fishing for the sake of catching a nice big fish, who were actually interested in selling or just eating themselves, filling their freezer with fish and weren't very bothered about the size. Uh, A lot of people like smaller bass because they like a bass that they can have a whole bass on their plate. So that tends to create an incentive to take smaller fish. And so just from the point of view of there being a lot less legal fish, that could increase the manpower, I guess, quite significantly, in that um, there could be a lot less compliance immediately. And we'd have to impose a high level of compliance with a high level of enforcement, at least for a period until the industry got used to it. Sticking with the bylaw theme, and at the same time going back to the Hesham situation we touched on earlier, to demonstrate that bylaws can be effectively used to protect bass, here in the North West we've already tabled a controversial bylaw to restrict all fishing within the Hesham Bass Nursery area, with the country's first total fishing ban, both commercial and angling, and we're assured that this will actually make policing easier rather than harder. Why then would other regulatory or commercial exclusion orders for the species not also have the same effect? What is it then about Hesham that makes it such a special case? Well, part of the problem is the access, and it's a particular feature of Hesham that a fishery officer is extremely visible as as soon as he hoves into view at the end of the track, and fishermen along the track and along the side of the power station where they fish, they can see the fishery officer coming and offload everything into the sea. That means that enforcing the situation at the moment is quite difficult. And we've got an anomaly at Hesham because the non-commercial fishermen can take fish from the shore, whereas the commercial fisherman in a boat, he can't. He's subject to buyers and sellers. That seems like an unfairness, and we're reducing the effectiveness of the bass nursery area at Hesham by allowing fishing to take place. There's no other significant fishing, no other species really fished in that area. It is only bass, and so it's convenient and effective to make a complete prohibition on all fishing within the bass nursery area to increase the effectiveness of the bass nursery area and hopefully to provide bigger and better bass for everybody outside the nursery area and, uh, and across the district. That's really our aim. 
What would your comments be on the suggestion that bass should be made a recreational species only? It's very difficult to do that when it is such a clear commercial species. You can go to any restaurant in the country virtually and you'll find bass on the menu as a valued connoisseur fish. It's very difficult to think of making it entirely recreation when it's so valuable at the moment and so many incomes depend on it. If it becomes under threat and it's clearly unsustainable and we have to do something to manage it, then we'll have to manage it. And how we do that at the time, when we have that evidence, we go through all the suggestions that you've made, consider any of them. Any of them could be effective, and making it a recreational fish could be one alternative. I'm not even sure that all anglers would be very supportive of that, though, because a lot of them like to, do, to fill their freezers and take it home to eat and uh, maybe even sell it sometimes. Illegally sell it. They legally sell it. Maybe they do. Yeah, they do. Yeah, we know they do. And that's part of the reason, again, for the Hesham bylaw, to try and make that just a little bit more difficult. But if putting bass on place is the stumbling block, then surely bass farms both could and would step up production to plug that potentially lucrative gap in the market. Oh, they do. I mean, yes, uh, if you see a, an under 35 centimetre bass now, it's almost certainly, or at least they will say it's come from a fish farm, and it probably has. There's a lot that's farmed. But there's still a premium for a wild fish, isn't there? And uh, it applies to any of the uh, farm species that the wild fish attracts a premium. One of the problems with fishery management, which I often hear quoted, is that being a member of a federal union under the banner of the EU makes unilateral protection measures unworkable. Yet the Irish appear to have made major strides in the protection of their bass. So how are they managing to achieve what the UK government say they can't? I don't know. I don't think they're evading them. I think we could make UK regulations for bass because it's not an EU commercial species. It's not a quota species. We can't do much with the likes of place and cod and the uh, quota species, but I think we could make our own regulations for bass. It's just a question of whether it's effective to do it at the UK level, and it would be better if it was done at the EU level. But no, I think if there's a need to do it, UK level would be a big improvement. I would support that. And I think the government could do it. I think it was on the point of doing it, actually, five or six years ago, wasn't it, when this last went, uh, went round this mulberry bush. They, they were on the point of making a, a regulation to increase the minimum landing size, and it got scotched at the last minute. So I think we can make UK regulations. I don't think there's a problem with doing that. Talk is starting to emerge again regarding a 45 centimetre bass limit, but is there actually anything behind it? Have you picked up anything perhaps in the pipeline that suggests this could be coming? Nothing definite. As I say, it's come up at, um, at meetings of the Association of Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authorities where all the chairmen of all the authorities get together. It has been raised because at a number of committees they've had uh, representations from anglers that the size should be increased. And uh, we've written to the minister as an association about it. We've had a reply which is in the public domain if you want it and I think he is still considering it. <laughs> Few people, be the anglers or otherwise, can have failed to be aware of the campaign by TV chef Hugh Fernley Whittingstall regarding legislative anomalies which he took on camera all the way to the EU fishery minister in Brussels, which is where prime fish out of quarter, as well as legally undersized fish, were being shoveled back dead, and ways of reducing unwanted fish being scooped up in the first place. A very noble cause which drew in bucket loads of support. But what the programme failed to do was offer workable solutions that wouldn't leave the whole process open to exploitation when you suddenly allow people to bring in fish they previously couldn't keep. It doesn't really influence us in the way we approach the management policy. So I haven't really got any, any opinions. I very much support the environmental campaign to reduce discards. I think the, the EU common fisheries policy is a it's a personal view because lots of fishermen wouldn't support me in that. Maybe members of the committee wouldn't support me, but I very much support a ban on discards. I think that's, that's one measure that uh, we should bring in as soon as we can. And so from that point of view, I would support Hugh in his, uh, in his efforts and all the other TV chefs and uh, environmental campaigners because that's one of the leading things that they campaign for. But apart from that, we have to assess our management measures on the best scientific evidence and the best data that we've got and make the best decisions uh, as far as we can for the industry locally and um, 
for the wider environment. So we, I think we try not to be influenced by I personally still have reservations. Fish are going to be sought out and caught deliberately, though supposedly accidentally, which would otherwise not have been the case, particularly say in poor weather, when a boat might do a few tows over the grounds closer in instead of taking a battering well off, all of which becomes counterproductive. You have to have enforceable safeguards. Just what those might be is not for anglers to put on the table. So have you any suggestions or thoughts on that score? I suppose from a simplistic point of view, if you ban discards and you give fishermen a quota, the incentive then is to catch the best fish that they can to achieve their quota, because they're worth more. So they're going to adjust their net size, their mesh size, their gear in any way they can to catch the best fish, which will deliver a quota made up of their best fish. That, I think, would be the sort of policy incentive of banning discards. Everything they catch has to be landed, so there's a real incentive not to catch undersize or cheap fish. You would effectively, I suppose, do away with the size limits because they wouldn't be any use if you couldn't discard undersized fish. You have to land everything. They want to maximise the value, so the incentive would be, I mean, for example, first of all, to use a bigger mesh size and to use ways of, of clearing them, so shorter toes, so that the net's clear and they only then bring home the best fish and, and overall do a lot less damage to the environment. I know that's a bit simplistic and perhaps hard to apply in practice, but I think from a general policy point of view, that has to be the way we try and push the fishing industry. But they can still discard the lowest value fish and say nothing. On top of that, once a quarter of a species is reached, do they then stop fishing altogether? Because if they carry on targeting something else, but still scoop up the quarter achieved species, we're back to square one with either discarding or allowing them to profit from a quarter protected species. For me, the only way you can enforce it is when a quarter limit is reached, be that for a single species or a mix of species total together, all fishing has to stop, which we all know isn't going to happen. It is the only way you can enforce it, yes. And in a mixed fishery, very difficult to selectively catch one particular size or one particular species. And that's probably the big problem of fishing in European waters. They're very mixed fisheries. And, and it makes technical measures very difficult to apply. But I still think it's the way we have to try and go. One other topic which a lot of anglers are getting concerned about, and therefore potentially one of the biggest hot topics currently waiting in the wings, is marine conservation zones. What are they? What are they intended to do? And most important of all, what effect, if any, are they likely to have on angling in terms of where we can or can't fish? Can you shed any light here on that subject? Actually, I can't. It's not my policy, it's government policy. It was brought in through the Marine Act, and they said they were going to bring in this suite of marine conservation zones. And as yet, I'm not at all clear, and from a personal point of view, what conservation benefit will be delivered from marine conservation zones. In this district, the northwest of England, out to six miles, if all the marine conservation zones were designated, we'd have over 70% of the naught to six mile zone designated in some form or another, and about 90% of the coastline by length. So we have to me, a huge over-designation of areas in the northwest of England. It's not true everywhere, but it is true here. From a fishery management point of view, we're supposed to treat protected areas as special. But if everywhere's protected, nowhere's special. You're back where you started, actually. So I'm not at all clear what benefits they will bring in. Some of them, they say there will be no change in the management measures. One of the ones in the consultation this time is it's called filed offshore. It's a big area of, of sand off the filed coastline, part of the shell flat system. And they say they want to designate it, but there will be no change in the management measures on the site. I have to say that looking at our experience with European marine sites, that's what they said in the 90s when they brought those in and now they're ratcheting up the level of protection on European marine sites to a very high level where activities are becoming increasingly restricted. If they did that for marine conservation zones then fishing would become increasingly restricted, there's no doubt. And fishing using any sort of damaging gear, and by that I mean uh, you know seabed gear, 
would be the first to uh, to be pr- become restricted or, or prohibited. The fundamental question I feel duty bound to ask here is: Should anglers be worried by any of this? Well, in in general, I would certainly argue that angling has a very low impact on environmental features, and I think there's very little case at the moment for saying that angling should be restricted in order to protect fish stocks or to protect the wider marine environment. So I certainly in in this district won't be advising the North West IFCA that it needs to be restricting angling. There may be particular areas where you get huge numbers of anglers where they might damage salt marsh or short coastal habitats or something just by trampling and um, you know overuse. But apart from that, I, I can't see that we're going to need to be restricting anglers. We just want to know, I think, a little bit more about how much they're catching, what they're catching, what the main interests are that they want to go for, so we understand it a bit better, and we can take that into account when we're, we're planning further new regulations. That's your personal, individual viewpoint. But there are interest groups within IFCAS that could, if they decided to unite, try to steer legislation in a particular way. There are, but I don't think there's really a a, a force that would be anti-angling, if that's what you would be afraid of. I I think uh, the IFCA is meant to base its regulations on scientific information, best scientific data, best scientific evidence. So I think there has to be evidence before we make a regulation. And uh, at the moment, I don't see any sign of any evidence, any data, which suggests that angling is causing significant environmental harm. You mentioned earlier the angling survey and the need to gather information from anglers on what they do in order to better understand their input. The problem is that you haven't sold the idea sufficiently well to us. Most are at least mildly suspicious, and just because you get answers to your questions doesn't necessarily mean you're hearing the truth, even though the truth might actually work to anglers' advantage. Yes, uh, well, I think the Angling 2012 has made a start with that. Alistair has been out, he's talked to lots of anglers, as I said before, and he's generally found that they're willing to talk and willing to tell him all about what they're doing and what they're catching and so on and so forth. So I think we've made a start. We are planning as part of our IFCA duties to extend our stakeholder involvement and our consultation with local interest groups If uh, there are angling associations, we want to build up a mailing list of them so that we can send out our newsletter to anglers and make contact that way. We will try and have comments on angling in the newsletter as regularly as we can and and, and put relevant information and so on 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 websites. We'd be happy to publicise angling events on our website, I guess. If they wanted to let us know when when they're happening, we could could undertake to do that if that would be helpful. Because uh, I would certainly be keen to show that we're not in any way against that sort of event and that sort of activity. And finally, is there anything else currently in the pipeline that anglers need to be concerned about? Well, I think the threats to the marine environment now are, are not from fishing. I think the threats are wider pollution, wider destruction of marine environment and coastal habitats, global warming, global accumulation of pollutants in the sea, which changes the acidity, increases the the levels of hydrocarbons and plastics and so on in the sea. I think these are the environmental issues that we need to focus on and anglers as users of the coastline and users of the sea, they're going to be concerned about those sorts of things, I would would imagine. Thank you for that and for giving up your time to do this recording. Anglers and commercial fishermen may not always agree, but one thing both see as a useful common goal is getting together under the umbrella of the Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authority to at least discuss matters in an ordered, structured way. And if I'm honest, through conversations with people who under different circumstances I may never have spoken to, I've been struck at times by the measure of responsibility and care some have for the environment and wanting to keep the status quo. In fact, as an evolutionary biologist by training, I'm probably more inclined to let things take their own course than many of them. After all, isn't it the case that when change does come about, one animal, plant or fish's disadvantage usually is another one's opportunity? That's how Darwinian evolution works, and when you look at the planet, things eventually always seem to come up smelling of roses, albeit with something new, regardless of the level of disaster preceding it. 
That said, I'm not sure I would describe the current explosion in dogfish numbers following on from the decline in many of our tablefish species as coming up smelling of roses. So yes, we do still need to manage fish stocks more carefully. More's the pity that here in the UK, it always seems to be too little too late. So in that regard, devolving the potential for some protection to regional Ithacas has to be seen as a valuable step forward. What they now need to do is to recognise the power they have through the bylaws and start flexing some muscle. As they say, watch this space. Mm -hmm.